Hi guys, welcome to the two o'clock showing of this semester's, or this year's 2018 Senior Capstone Symposium. Um, brought to you by Seth Herbst and Daniel Figueroa. Um, their presentation is on water sustainability in Harrisonburg, featuring gray water irrigation at Vine and Fig. So without further ado, give them a round of applause. And good luck. So um, welcome, thank you all for coming. Uh, our project involves studying gray water irrigation at the new community project uh, in downtown Harrisonburg in partnership with the Vine and Fig organization. Um, before we get into what we actually did for the project, just want to um, say a few words about why we chose it and a little bit about the project. Um, we were mainly interested in, de in um, developing and honing our skills that we had uh, acquired over the past couple years in, um, as ISAT majors. And um, gray water irrigation is a simple technology that's nested in a, um, a complex and multifaceted problem. Um, we encountered uh, socio, uh, social, economic, and political, and scientific dimensions throughout this entire project. Um, we were mainly interested in using gray water irrigation as a means to address uh, water conservation and food production issues, which um, kind of involve everybody as uh, stakeholders and um, and those two issues will, issues will become increasingly important as uh, we start to deal with the effects of climate change in the future. We were also interested in learning more about sustainability and water conservation and uh, infrastructure and to use all the skills that we had learned to answer the specific question of whether it is feasible to implement a gray water irrigation system at the Bun and Fig. All right, so many of you are probably asking, what is gray water? It's not a term that's very common. Well, while the definition varies per state, in Virginia it's defined as untreated wastewater coming from bathtubs, showers, laboratory fixtures, washing machines, and laundry tubs. But it excludes sources such as kitchen sinks and toilets just because of the uh, possible inherent health uh, effects that could be associated with water coming from those sources. It's used where drinking water quality is not an issue, it's not necessary, and has two main applications. The first being in industry, when it comes to cooling of equipment and machinery, and ma manufacturing processes, but the other application which we're studying for this project is its use in irrigation. So to study the feasibility of rainwater irrigation systems, we were working with the organization, the New Community Project at the Vine and Fig. This organization started back in 2003 and has focused, uh, has always been focused on sustainability and localized foods. Of the various projects that have been initiated there since the beginning, they all have a, uh, they all centered around a permaculture design. Permaculture meaning they preserve natural ecosystem patterns and also maintain food justice. The individual who actually reached, about, reached out to us about this project is Tom Benevento. He's the overseer of all the operations at Von and Fig, always seeking improvements on, on all the projects, always monitoring you know, their efficiency. And he reached out to us because he wanted to tackle on the environmental issue of water conservation. So we decided to uh, work closely with this organization because we wanted to improve the environmental, environmental education program at Von and Fig while also helping achieve their mission of peace, ecology, and justice. Uh, so this is a simple schematic of what a residential gray water irrigation system would look like. Uh, you see that all the sources of the gray water here, um, uh, laundry, bath sinks, and showers and bathtubs, where um, the plumbing is rerouted and the gray water is um, sent out into a garden for subsurface irrigation. Um, it's important to note here that we're talking about subsurface irrigation here, and um, that's supposed to minimize the uh, health risks associated with gray water um, in terms of irrigation. So. Um, our goal was to map out the implementation process and to assess the feasibility of getting one of these systems installed at the Vine and Fig. And um, the first thing that we started looking into was uh, the required permits and outside services that are uh, required for getting this thing done. But we quickly found out that, um, for reasons that we'll get into later, that this was gonna take a lot of time. So in the meantime, we um, saw what we could do to study gray water irrigation um, in the lab. And um, so in order to learn more about gray water irrigation, we designed experiments aimed at collecting data on gray water itself, gray water filtration, and um, assessing the potential effects of gray water on plant nutrient concentrations and uh, plant production. We also wanted to see if, the, if we could use any of our findings in the lab to inform our recommendations to Tom um, in implementing, um, operating, and um, getting the same, uh, system installed at the Vine Fig. So, um, just uh, to kind of give you an idea of what we were doing um, in, as far as growing plants, um, this is our typical data set of 
growing plants in the lab, we would have 18 pots of greens uh, grow, uh, grown with gray water and 18 pots of greens grown with tap water. And uh, we were able to get five data sets on plant production and three data sets on plant nutrient, nutrient um, concentrations. All right, so when it came to collecting samples of gray water, we decided to approach this by using various sources, various locations of shower water. So when we brought the samples to the lab, what we did is, which is required by the Virginia Plumbing Code's Appendix C, is that any irrigation system requires an approved filter. And so for the filter we chose for this system, we decided to create a mock sand filter. This was uh, constructed with the help of uh, environmental lab manager Kyle Snow. And of the components, we used a metal container, uh, drilled various holes at the bottom of it, and at the bottom layer of the container, we filled approximately one-fourth of it with gravel, and the remaining volume we filled with sand. And just for even uh, dispersal for the water when we poured in, we had the black cap placed in the center. That way we can kind of mitigate how fast it was uh, infiltrating to the bottom of the filter. What we also needed to study with gray water in the lab were the various characteristics associated with it. Uh, to do that, we used a lab instrument known as a W2W meter, pictured here on the right. This is a device that simply measured several various water parameters, such as turbidity, dissolved oxygen. But for the sake of this project, we only needed to measure pH, uh, the acidity, and conductivity, which measures uh, how well electricity would flow through water. And so for running a t-test, which compares two sample averages, we found that there was no statistical difference between the conductivity of tap water and gray water. But we did find that there was a significant difference between the, within the pH. Now, while this may seem like the gray water was, uh, again, it's more acidic and maybe more harmful, we didn't want to jump to that conclusion because from previous coursework, we studied that there are actually some crops and plants that actually favor more acidic conditions. So once we went uh, over a few trials of filtering our gray water, um, we started to notice that there was a disagreeable odor coming from our sand filter. So we wanted to see if, uh, what that was all about and uh, to see if it was affecting our gray water in any way. And it turns out that it was. Um, and we actually found out that our sand filter was a source for increasing contamination um, for filtration. And um, so this means in terms of removing bacteria and coliform forming units from our water, we were actually better off not running our water through the a filter in the first place, or the sand filter in the first place, um, which is kind of problematic because the system requires a filter. So um, we can't really uh, based on this, we can't really recommend that they use a sand filter in the actual system at the Vine Pig. All right, so one of the central questions of this project is, is this system going to feed crops? Is this going to stimulate plant growth? Is it going to inhibit it? Or is it not going to do anything at all? So to do that, we needed to measure the various nutrient concentrations from the samples we collected. So pictures here on the left, we have Seth going through the process of actually measuring the nitrogen concentration in the uh, samples we collected, just because uh, nitrogen is one of the, one of the Sorry, one of the most essential nutrients for plant growth. And on the right, we have uh, the lab manager showing us how to actually measure the, those concentrations through uh, various instruments in the lab. And what we found, based on those results, was that the gray water um, phosphorus concentration and nitrogen concentration were well below what the standard is for uh, what would be considered adverse effects or harmful effects to crops when it comes to uh, those nutrients. Uh, the third part of our lab component was investigating the potential effects of gray water on plant nutrients and plant production. Um, so we used baby greens, mainly spinach and lettuce, mainly because of their rapid growth period. Uh, more, uh, they, they, we were able to grow our plants with uh, between 30 and 40 days, which maximized the amount of data we can collect and uh, maximized the amount of trials we ran. We we relied on Waypoint Labs in Richmond to conduct our plant nutrient concentration analyses, and we weighed biomass using a balance in the ISAT labs uh, as an indicator of plant production. So um, these next few slides, I'm going to just throw some bar graphs at you, but uh, these are the results from uh, the Waypoint Labs, the uh, lettuce nutrient concentration details. and. Um, just uh, an important thing to remember is that the, the blue bars are uh, tap water lettuce, the gray bars are the gray water lettuce, and the green, the green bar is the normal range um, that we would expect for each nutrient based on the report from uh, Waypoint Labs. And the only three nutrients that we found that were uh, s statistically different between the gray water lettuce and the tap water lettuce was sulfur, iron, and potassium. And um, 
And uh, magnesium, sodium, and boron were very close to being statistically different, but we'll need to collect more data to um, verify that there's, there's, actual, there's an actual effect um, here. And uh, these are the rest of the nutrient concentration data that we were able to collect from Waypoint Labs. And all of these, we couldn't determine any statistical difference between any of these nutrients in uh, the gray water lettuce uh, compared to the tap water lettuce. The only thing out of the ordinary here that we noticed was that the calcium and the copper levels were uh, both lower in the tap water and uh, gray water. So what we also needed to compare for the tap water and gray water plants was the biomass or the weight of the plants. So we approached this by allowing a four-week period of the plants to germinate and show some sufficient uh, height in plant growth. And then we completely removed the biomass from all of the pots in each of the trays, uh, placed them in a tray, and then weighed them in the balance. And that was the weight for the wet biomass. Following a 48-hour period, we, al we allowed the plants to have, go through natural uh, evapotranspiration proce processes and measured the dry biomass. And so what we found was that based on the T-score, again, there was no significant difference between the gray water and tap water. However, based on the uh, dry biomass percentage, it was shown that gray water was actually uh, producing more nutrient-dense plants. However, again, based on the T-score, we couldn't jump to that conclusion immediately in saying that gray water was automatically better and healthier for the plants. So the very last thing that we did as our laboratory component of our project is we sent off um, three samples of soil um, and used uh, soil straight from the bag as control. And um, what we actually found was just generally everything was elevated um, that we measured for in the uh, both the gray water uh, soil and the tap water soil and we really didn't see any any real differences between the, those two. Uh, again we're going to need some more data to figure that out uh, to, to see um, what the actual effects on the soil are but um, as of now we don't really see uh, any calls for um, alarm for using gray water and the effects of soils. So. All right, so now that we had all this data collected from the lab and ran our experiments, the next phase was transitioning to the vitamin fig. How are these results going to relate to when we move to the actual site and build a system at the new community project? So um, as we're going through the explanation of how we uh, implemented the system, we did encounter some barriers, um, mainly system costs and knowledge and experience of the contractors and local officials that we were dealing with. Uh, these four barriers are, were actually um, kind of, they were found by the um, Virginia Cooperative Extension um, in partnership with the Virginia Tech and Virginia Union. They did a, um, a study on gray water irrigation as well. And they came up with these four ba potential barriers. The first two, like I said, we definitely encountered. Uh, this system, the system that we're trying to implement is not cheap and we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that later. But the um, the knowledge and experience of the contractors and local officials was our main, our main barrier that we encountered. We uh, would contact uh, people from the Virginia De Department of Health uh, where we needed to acquire permits from and the people wouldn't even know that their agency was uh, supposed to oversee this um, type of project. So um, yeah, that was our main issue that we got hung up on. So um, in Virginia, gray water irrigation is regulated at the state level, mainly by the um, Virginia Pl Plumbing Code Appendix C, which specifies all the design requirements, including the system configuration, the materials, the components, the relationship between the flow rate from the house, the percolation of the soil, and the required drainage area. And um, this is a schematic that is actually from the appendix C that we have to follow in when we're going to get the system installed, the Vina Fig. The Virginia Department of Health needs to uh, issue a permit before installation be, uh, can begin. Um, and before they do that, they need to review our um, design, our layout on the property, and our intent of the system. And another thing is, is that we're gonna have to get some plumbing alterations to the house at the Vina Fig which is gonna require a permit from the local code of ordinances as well. So when it came to the system design of the Vine Fig, we realized that there were some factors that we couldn't really assess or measure that uh, within the lab. One of those being the daily flow estimates. So it's standard that from a four person household that the, uh, the outflow from a shower source, which is what we planned on connecting the system to, is 100 gallons of water per day. And you can imagine that uh, comparing it to how we were collecting gray water, which is only five gallons a week, that you know, certain parameters are gonna vary uh, substantially. 
Another thing that we needed to consider was the percolation of the water in the soil for the uh, irrigation system. Percolation simply, simply refers to the water absorption rate. And while we were trying to acquire services for this for the test, uh, again, we had no feedback. We were leaving endless calls and messages for people to acquire the services. We actually had to perform them ourselves. So we followed a percolation testing protocol. And we found that, based on the results, that the drainage area where the garden that would be irrigated by the system would need to be at least 125 square feet of land per 100 gallons of gray water coming from the shower. We have found, though, that this would not be an issue because from measuring the actual area itself, the garden that at the Vine and Fig, it came out to a total of 500 square feet. So the percolation test essentially passed. However, what we also needed to consider when it came to moving to the site itself was that the entire com configuration of the plumbing for the shower would need to be uh, completely altered. And that would also require an extensive amount of materials and equipment to actually get the system in the ground. So here we have an aerial view of the Vinefic property itself. As you can see here, uh, we decided to place the, the uh, reservoir and the system entirely on the west portion of the building. And this is also because Tom has a specific location of the crops he wanted irrigated by the system, and they were located at this uh, spot. And we also chose location based on where the shower uh, was located on the second floor. It's from walking through the building itself, it's located up here. So we thought that just to reduce the cost, it'd be better than feeding the system around, then, and uh, it would reduce the cost for the PVC pipe being associated with uh, the, the irrigation lines. So from there, we would have the reservoir, uh, we would have the shower feed PVC lines into the reservoir, and then from the reservoir, we'd have various irrigation lines indicated here in blue, feed to the drainage area, which is indicated in white. Once the uh, system is installed, there's going to be a minimum level of operations and maintenance that are involved in just up keeping up the system and making sure that it's working properly. We came up, we, we thought of a kind of what that minimum would be, and we were thinking that there would have to be daily inspections for flooding, making sure all the components are in work, good working condition, making sure that the reservoir pressure matches the atmospheric pressure, and um, just making sure that none of the plants are being degraded by your irrigation system. And um, also, residents in the house need to be cognizant of what they're draining, um, or sending down the drains. That means no strong acids, no bases, using minimal soap and detergent. And um, uh, actually, what's required um, by the Appendix C is that um, re the reservoir must be drained at least once per day, um, just to limit the amount of time that the gray water uh, is in the the reservoir, and that can also help with mosquito control, um, especially in the summer where um, mosquitoes like to breed in standing water. Water, so you don't want your mosquito, you don't want your system to be basically a source for uh, mosquito breeding. So um, draining that reservoir daily is um, a, a good idea. And also, um, we recommended at least periodic laboratory testing of plant tissue and soil to just kind of continue to monitor the effects on the environment and um, the, uh, your garden environment uh, when using this system. All right, so when it came for budgeting for the system itself, this was easily the most difficult uh, problem to overcome, as you can see by that picture there. Uh, when it came to acquiring the permits for uh, you know the percolation testing and the services as well, again, we were persistent with the calls and the emails, and yet people would either just disregard those messages or when we did get in contact with them, they would have you know, no knowledge on the systems at all. But what we were able to receive was a consultation on the materials and installations, and we received this information from an associate of Tom, uh, Phil Castle, who works as a plumbing consultant in Harrisburg. And from doing a few walkthroughs, he determined that when it comes to the manual labor and the materials involved, the total would come out to $2,600. Uh, we added that additional $200 for services because of what, what percolation testing, uh, like official percolation, percolation testing and not done by us would be, and that was a minimum of $200. So it would come out of $2,600 uh, uh, total, but again, that's excluding everything else that would be associated with uh, maintaining the system. So I'm um, using that $2,600 as a minimum cost for the system, and assuming that the garden is irrigated completely by a single source, which is one shower, and um, the water and sewer rates remain constant in Harrisonburg at 43, 42 per 5,000 uh, gallons, which um, is not gonna stay that way. But um, we calculated that the return on, on investment for getting one of these systems in place at a residence would be approximately eight years minimum. And that's not including uh, any of the, the permit per permitting prices that we weren't able to obtain, uh, any of the maintenance or unexpected replacements of materials that you may need throughout the um, course of the operation of the system. 
So that kind of leads us to believe that um, implementing one of these systems for the sole purpose of saving money on your water bill, uh, that may not be a sufficient enough reason to do it. Um, there would have to, there probably have to be other motivations to, to get that done. So. All right, so now you're all probably asking, all right, so what, is, what does the system do for me? How do I benefit from this? So even though the return on investment might seem kind of long and there's operations and maintenance, maintenance behind it, there are still various benefits associated with gray water recycling and irrigation systems in general. The first of those being the reduced infrastructure requirement when this is adopted. As a country, we're always going to need to be improving our infrastructure. It's always a need for updating and, and improvements. However, when you adopt this type of system, what you're doing is you're privatizing water conservation and therefore you're actually aiding in future infrastructure updating. The second benefit of these types of systems is the decrease in wastewater treatment costs. If these wastewater treatment facilities are receiving a lower volume of water, that means there's lower cost behind removing the pollutants and you know, constituents in the water, which at the end of the day saves that business money. And that plays in directly with the third benefit, which is the reduced water consumption when it comes for lawn and garden purposes. As opposed to having water just sent down the drain to the sewage line, to the wastewater treatment facilities, and then using additional water to irrigate you know, crops and flowers, what have you, you'd be using this irrigation system as one water source for multiple purposes. And the final benefit, uh, and the next benefit of this, these systems is that you're providing ecosystem service to an urbanized community. And um, going off the point of bringing ecosystems to an urban community, um, there is, uh, there's a strong connection between gray water and food production here. Um, so if we're having more and more people grow foods in their home gardens and in their yards, we are um, potentially reducing the, um, the, uh, our reliance on developing the surrounding landscape for new farmland to produce more food. Um, and this can help cities become more self-sufficient in terms of food production and food consumption. It also optimizes the food supply, ch um, food supply chain by um, minimizing the, uh, the distance that food has to travel into cities. Um, this also provides immediate access to healthy, nutritious, nutritious foods. If people are growing more vegetable, vegetables, they're more likely going to be eating more vegetables. Uh, gray water can also help mitigate the effects of drought and the increased water um, demand from hotter temperatures that we're expecting from climate change. And um, also gray water can be used as a tool for addressing foods, food insecurity, uh, especially in urban communities. So going off on the food insecurity, as uh, Seth mentioned, uh, food insecurity is defined by USDA as lacking enough access to um, healthy foods for a healthy and active lifestyle for all household members. And while it's not an issue in certain areas, in the regions that it is an issue, the, there are several societal and health effects. So here we have percentages of comparing different regions with food insecurity that vary with it based on a geographic region and scale. As you can see, uh, in areas that are more urbanized, such as Harrisonburg and the city of Richmond, the food insecurity rate is substantially higher than areas where there are more rural and communities are more spread out, such as Rockingham County, which Harrisonburg is located in. So what we conclude based on these numbers is that when uh, higher population densities are the result of food insecurity. If you're living in a city such as Richmond with population is high, that food demand is always going to be at a certain level compared to somewhere like Rockingham County where that demand is not as you know, uh, critical. And that just shows why the, uh, having a prototype and why implementing the system would be so ideal because this allows us to see, all right, is this the best way, best way to tackle this issue? Is there another approach we should take? Is this feasible enough? And if not, what are the alternatives? And going off of that, this is a projection showing uh, the population and water demand in Harrisonburg within the next 20 to 30 years. So as we here see here in the blue line, the population is expected to increase by the, in the year 2040 by 56%. And this shows almost a direct linear relationship with the increase in water demand by 2040, which increases by 66%. Now, while Harrisonburg is not currently in a uh, water crisis uh, issue or not currently facing a uh, water scarcity problem, this is something that needs to be a uh, uh, be uh, dealt with in the next 100 years. Uh, as of right now, we've used uh, several tributaries to provide us with millions of gallons of water a day. But again, that's an expansion approach, and we're using let's exploit this tributary, and now let's use this river. And while it's supplying us with the water we need, there's going to be a point where we need to be like, all right, let's start using the water conservation approach as opposed to you know expanding to different sources. So we made it to the, the conclusion part, and. Um the first thing that we want to mention is that the, for our laboratory experiments, our field conditions and our, the lab conditions are, are going to be different. So, um, for example, our crops that we grew were um, grown indoors and they weren't subject to normal weather, pa weather patterns. They were exposed to 12 hours of UV light a day, even in the wintertime. 
And um, we used a uh, relatively high quality soil um, to grow these plants. And our gray water didn't run through any kind of plumbing system or any kind of system at all. We just collected it from the bottoms of our shower. So um, all those things kind of help us or make it hard for us to generalize our results from the lab um, and apply it to what a gray water irrigation system would be like at the Biden Fig. So the things that we can conclude uh, regarding our lab conditions are that um, the properties of gray water and tap water are going to be different and that plant, um, that the plant, or plant nutrient concentrations are likely to be affected by uh, using gray water to irrigate. So the next uh, conclusion we made was that there is a lot of difficulty when it comes to physically implementing the system. Again, uh, we used to reiterate that permitting process, had we you know, acquired this, these permits and appropriate services early on, we could have uh, gotten the system in the ground within a matter of weeks. And so that was a, an extreme obstacle for us. And also with that, going off of that is the prices, and materials of, the prices of materials and labor associated with getting in the ground. Uh, again, you saw that $2,600 minimum, and that's excluding all of the costs associated with the permits and services. So they kind of have to budget for like you know how long this would take and how much of you know how much money this will actually cost to get in the ground. And finally, uh, is the monitoring and maintenance. If the system is at all faulty, if there is you know a certain source that you need to be that needs to be fixed, it's going to take a lot of time and a lot of patience to you know make sure that it's properly functioning to get all the right components to work together so that your crops are not being affected. And at the end, you know your money and budget is not being affected as well. So back to our original question of whether or not this system is feasible to implement. Um, based on our findings, we don't really think that it is in terms of pricing, but uh, when we're considering the externalized costs of, uh, and the environmental costs associated with extracting water from our surrounding resources and using it one time, um, usually wastefully, and um, uh, spending money to treat it and then send it right back out to, um, into the environment, um, when we're considering those issues, uh, the um, costs might offset the um, the unfeasibility of the pricing um, that we encountered. Yeah. <clears throat> so, some future directions that we want this project to take, and um, that we've already taken steps for it um, for it to continue, are um, the community surveys. One of the potential barriers that we mentioned earlier was homeowner acceptance. Daniel and I have uh, developed a questionnaire that's. Uh, currently going through the IRB process review. And um, the questionnaire is designed to assess Harrisonburg, Har the Harrisonburg community's willingness to adopt these systems on a, a wide scale. So that's a question that we're wanting to get answered in the future. And um, another thing is that we, we really want to make sure that uh, when the system is in place that we have a filter that's effective. We found that our sand, that the sand filter is making our gray water dirtier, which is obviously not a good thing. And our um, our successor, Luke Boswell, um, on this project is already looking into this um, this problem and um, is expected to be the main focus of his part of this um, project. Yeah. And last but not least, as stated before, it's obtaining those permits and inspections. If these are acquired early on, this project can be you know easily done within a matter of weeks in a month's time frame. However, without those, you, you're going to be kept from moving forward. So. We advising off, we're also advising our successor Luke Basel to make that his top priority when it comes to the future of this project. So um, that was our presentation, and um, we want to thank uh, Dr. Jennifer Kaufman, our um, capstone advisor, for um, leading us every step of the way for this project and consistently encouraging us to um, think more broadly about the problems that we we're trying to address. Um, thank you very much. We'd also like to thank Tom Benevento, who didn't make it today, uh, but Tom, again, was the overseer of the project, the Vine and Fig. Tom was always enthusiastic about where he stood with the project, always trying to cooperate with us, providing us with the, the tools and uh, data that we need, so he was very helpful. And we also wanted to thank um, Cornelius France, who also works at the Vine and Fig. When it came to collecting gray water from the Vine and Fig property itself, he was taking the time to do it two times a week, so without him, we would have gotten that variability on the data. And we also want to thank Kyle Snow, our um, ISAT laboratory um, manager. Without Kyle, we wouldn't have been able to collect any data in the lab or perform any experiments. <laughs> so um, thank you very much, Kyle, for um, teaching us how to um, perform the, the um, analyses that we were trying to get done. I was going to make today, uh, we'd also like to thank Phil Castle, who was the plumbing consultant for the project. Without Phil, there, there's, 
good chance that we probably wouldn't have any uh, numbers when it comes to the estimates for it. So he was, uh, we want to thank him because he took the time to do a few walkthroughs and uh, did a dedicate, like, dedicate how we should uh, go about uh, budgeting for the project. And we also want to thank Luke for um, taking on this project after we graduate and um, inheriting all the problems that we, <laughs> that we created in trying to get this thing done. So thank you. Thank you. Question about the regulations. So you mentioned a little bit about the authority, and the, the, it sounds like the agency doesn't even know they have that authority. Yes. Is, are they treated similar to a septic system? Is that essentially the same legislation that controls gray water disposal? Um, yes. The, so the Virginia Plumbing Code does have um, specifications for septic systems, and those require percolation tests as well, right. and everything like that. So um, yeah, yeah. Did that answer your question? <laughs> yeah, I just didn't know. It sounds like, I mean, the, the design that you showed is very similar to what you have with a septic system, where you have a settling basin and then you have some drainage lines that go out. Um, are those sized the same based upon flow? And we didn't. It didn't um, sound like you needed as much area as you might need for a septic system, so I'm just wondering if there were yeah. uh, special conditions for gray water disposal as opposed to. A full brown water disposal. Uh, there are. Um, I don't know what the specifications for s um, septic systems are, but there are actually um, irrigation line spacing uh, specifications. There are um, specifications for excavation sizing and all the materials that we're using for the system once we get it in place. So um, yeah, it's very much regulated like a like a septic system. Only is I guess uh, lesser known. Yeah, so we, we contacted like you know, the Department of Health. We called the uh, Harrisonburg Department of Public Utilities, and none of them, again, no information on it, or just just dodging our calls. I know an ISAC graduate in the Department of Health. Maybe wanted to take it. So what's his name? Because we may have talked to him. We're trying to anyway. <laughs> yeah, we called him like various mm -hmm. times, multiple times. The best was Daniel's multiple calls that over three weeks ended him back at the same person with whom we started. <laughs> yep. That was one of my yep. favorites. <laughs> So um, along the lines of regulation, does it matter what you're growing with the gray water? Like because you were proposing growing food, were there additional regulations on it? No, there were not actually. Um, so <clears throat> the, there, there's not even a requirement to have the, uh, the water disinfected either. But um, no, they had no uh, specifications for what types of crops you should be growing. Just the fact that it should be subsurfacely irrigated. And maybe also like ranges for certain again uh, concentrations like uh, for nutrients like phosphorus nitrogen that shouldn't be exceeded that would be more harmful to the plant than uh, than you know than stimulating plant growth. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. Please. Well, I'm, I'm also curious if you know the type of soap and shampoo matters and the type of yes. laundry detergent and what effect those could have. Exactly. On um, long term education. So um, when I was trying to blow through those bar graphs for you guys, um, <coughs> I didn't. I forgot to mention that like. Those results kind of, those raised more questions than answers for us. And we tried to reach out to the biology department here at JMU and no one was able to get back to us on it. Um, but we really, we really didn't really understand exactly why these specific nutrients were higher in the, in the gray water plants as opposed to the tap water plants. We suspected that they had something to do with the products that we were using. Um, and we know that potassium, magnesium, and sodium are main components of sweat, so we're kind of hypothesizing that that could be the reason why those nutrient comp compositions are higher, but other than that, we, we just have, we have more questions about that than answers. I think one of the things that we spent a lot of time discussing was clearly gray water had more nutrients added to it, and clearly the plants, some of it was bioavailable because it came up in the plants, and so if we had a lot more time, money, and had not already driven Kyle nearly crazy, <laughs> Um, with asking for a thousand things, then it would have been really interesting to do more thorough analyses of the water and the plants and to see if we could start to discern the kinds of ingredients in the products. But the all the gray water samples that they were collecting, people were not using, they were using pretty biodegradable kinds of products. Yeah, just the sources from collecting it, again, we, we chose uh, various locations, uh, my apartment complex, set the apartment complex on the bottom fig cell. So yeah, we uh, kind of like, approximated the variability, so it was not like this is all average uh, from one type of gray water. So that also can contribute you know, to the variability in the different types of uh, nutrients. And the vine and fig is 
careful about the kinds of products that they use too, which is one of the things that was considered about this particular system at that particular location, is they're super groovy about the products that they use. Yeah. Um, so you, got, you said you have to drain the tank daily, um, and maybe this is a two-part question. Um, if you have to drain the tank daily, if you're at a time where you don't necessarily need to water the garden, where are you discharging? Oh, you, okay. Yeah, I have a 100-gallon tank of water. Are you sending that back into the standard sewer? Yes, based on the schematic here, you see there's a Yeah, a so um, the reservoir actually has to have um, three connections uh, to um, release the gray water. One of them is actually the irrigation release, but um, there's supposed to be a drain on the bottom of the reservoir to, that's the one that you're gonna use to drain every 24 hours. And there's also one on top just to make sure that there's gonna be no overflow. Um, and both of these two drains need to be connected to the um, sanitary drainage system for the city. So you were talking to bury this tank would be buried in the ground, uh, or is it above ground? Most likely not. I mean, because we're hoping to just have it like a be a gravity feed, and we'll, we don't want to use a pump or anything. So it, it's actually we're thinking it's probably going to be raised in the air. And then this sort of leads into the question that you're anticipating from me, which is, <laughs> we have an extremely rainy time, and you don't need to water your garden, and you have to discharge that. Uh, what would be the advantage of implementing this as a gray water system? as an alternative to just a rainwater catchment system? So um, ideally you, would, you could use both of these systems at the same time just to kind of optimize uh, the, those issues. But um, also another thing is that it kind of depends on where you are and whether or not yeah. you receive enough rain. And so if you're in a climate where it's always a constant precipitation, that's probably a good alternative to it. But with gray water, it's always a constant source of you know water feeding through the house and then feeding to the system. It's more persistent. Yeah. So um, in maybe a more arid region, you, you uh, a gray water irrigation system could be more reliable if you have a centralized water infrastructure. Yeah. Yes. Uh, question. So in, in your implementation challenges, you raised. Uh, uh, resident acceptance is a potential issue, you know, that, that yeah. can, can they slow you down. I'm curious, is that, do you think, is that opposition based on, A, they don't really want people coming in, disrupting their residence and breaking into their plumbing system and everything that goes with that, or is it more about concerns about the effects of the environment and, and you know, irrigating stuff coming out of the bathtub? So that's what the questions are designed around. Uh, one, uh, one of the questions is, uh, do you value, you know, the idea of water recycling and whatnot? Like, are you like conscious? Like, do you care about the environment, sustainability? That's one of the questions. And then um, another question is about like, you know, are you are you focused on garden care and like, do you have a garden and whatnot? So there are questions that address that, and there's also questions that kind of state, all right, um, as we show, well, thing we have to imply too with the kind of go over the survey is uh, would be willing to you know upkeep you know those maintenance and operations associated with the irrigation system. Yeah. And um, we actually read previous studies that did those surveys, and we found that there's like. I think over a 90% acceptance rate of getting these things done, whether or not they're going to go through with it or not, but there's um, there's just generally an accepting attitude um, based on the literature um, of implementing these systems. But major reasons why people didn't want it to be implemented was just they thought it was nasty. <laughs> Which is fair. Yeah. Um, could this system be used as like a model uh, for other systems in other locations, or is it location specific? Um, oh, so that's the goal of it. Again, this would serve as a prototype for Harrisonburg, and if it were to, you know, prove successful, if the vine fig displays, you know, like say things on their water bill and whatnot, the operations aren't as bad, then yes, it could be used as a prototype for almost anywhere. And the goal in the future, maybe not, you know, the short term, the goal is to expand it on a large scale. Can I have one qualifying comment to what you guys have said? So the other thing, back to Kyle's question about drain it out daily, even they did multiple perk tests and they went with the slowest draining to estimate the minimum drain field size. So there are other portions of the property that drain more quickly, but they decided to go with a conservative esti estimate. Yep. And so one of the ways to drain it could be to go upslope and drain it in the permaculture bed up there. So that could be, and that's one of the benefits of having it be gravity fed, because you can just put a drainage hose and then drain it still in the land because it perks pretty well overall. All right, uh, <coughs> sorry to cut the short guys. I don't know if you have any more questions, but uh, we do have another presentation in five minutes. So let's thank these guys.